But yeah, welcome to the menopause management lecture. So this is for helping females with menopause. So menopause for the modern mom, I call it. Uh, so today we're going to cover basically what it is, you know, what are the symptoms, uh, what can we do about it ultimately. Uh, so with the event details out of the way, let's dive into it. So first of all, what is menopause? So menopause is called a pause for a reason. So essentially, a pause in menses. So periods stop because the ovaries have stopped producing the follicles. So you don't have um, that roughly, you know, month monthly menstrual bleed. Because of that, hormones just stay very low. So how it often gets diagnosed is that, you know, you go to the doctors and you say, hey doc, you know, I'm 52 years old. Uh, you know, I noticed a year ago that I haven't had any period. And then you get diagnosed with menopause, which that has its own problems uh, with the diagnosis. But, you know, we'll cover that in a little bit later. Um, but the average age of this, you know, we could call it retirement of the ovaries is 51 years old, but the range is anywhere between 45 to 65. So this just depends on, you know, the individual, you know, there might be some genetic elements to this because um, you also have some women who they get really upset, you know, like, gosh, you know, I've reached menopause um, really early at the age of like 46. Well, you shouldn't be because, you know, that is still within the range. So women can, you know, start menopause all the way up from you know, 46 onwards. Uh, so 40 to 45. Yes, that's probably, I would say, um, a bit on the early side, so early menopause. And then if you're under 40, then yeah, that most likely is other issues um, and not menopause. But bear in mind that this is a range. And, you know, there as always with ranges, there's always outliers as well. Um, so perimenopause. So this is probably a little bit more tricky. Perimenopause is anything typically from 40 years old onwards. And it's where the ovaries kind of go part time, you could call it. So, you know, some cycles, you know, it's wonderful. It's a joyous flow that, you know, you're used to and there's no problems at all. But there's other times where the ovaries are like, really, you know, I was kind of having a rest there. And so you might not ovulate on those. Um, so you won't produce any progesterone. So progesterone is a hormone that uh, prepares the lining of your uterus uh, for a fertilized egg to grow. So if pregnancy doesn't occur, this lining sheds and that's where, uh, you know, you get the bleed. Um and or yeah so that's when you get the bleed so when progesterone is low it can give you those uh, irregular cycles um, and it becomes a little bit more difficult in terms of con conceiving you potentially have more um, likelihood of um, you know pregnancy loss and also your mood changes and you get like anxiety potential uh, so this brings us on to you know the health implication that you know, I mentioned a little bit earlier. So the health implications. So the main cause of death after menopause is typically, you know, cardiovascular disease and not breast cancer, as most females uh, tend to believe. Estradiol and progesterone being low, um, they're really important for controlling, you know, the good and the bad cholesterol and the control of blood pressure and also, you know, your heart rate. If you don't have these amazing hormones around that's when it becomes a high risk for cardiovascular disease um, and then there's also uh, an impact on metabolic health as well so um so there becomes an increase in insulin resistance as um, you reach menopause so due to the lower levels of these hormones so insulin resistance is kind of like how um you you respond to digesting food so when you eat food your body converts that food into sugar um and then the sugar uses insulin to go through this door and it gets broken down to then be absorbed and used as energy right when you're insulin resistance what happens is this key is rusty and it no longer works so the sugar that you get from the food it's trying to go past this door but the key's not working right so then it just kind of gets left in here and then you end up not having that much energy um you end up becoming tired um and that's basically what insulin resistance kind of right like that um so let me go back to the slide before so in terms of, you know, long story short with this, this is why there becomes a higher chance of you developing type 2 diabetes when you are insulin resistant, right? It doesn't mean that you necessarily will get diabetes, but there potentially is a higher chance. Insulin and estradiol are an estrogen, you know, they're muscle building hormones, you know, so being resistant to that and not producing as much of these hormones means that you have more potential increases in fat stores. Now, all of this sounds very gloomy and sad, but there's also more of it. Um, as we go into the physical uh, implications. So the physical implications, you know, estrogen is the female sex hormone. So this is what regulates your female cycle. And, you know, you could call it the queen for bone health, right? So it's used to help bone forming, which is why menopause uh, or during menopause, when estrogen decreases, you get higher chances of 
uh, osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is where the bones uh, become more frail. Uh, this can cause, you know, um, this is where you're going to get the old people who shrink. So when you see you know, your grandma, you're like, hey, you know, you like, you really shrunk with your age. And this is part of it, right? When you get osteoporosis, you know, the bones becomes a lot more frail. And why you get that shrinkage in height is when, you know, the vertebrae or the bones of that spine becomes compressed and crushed down due to the lack of bone mineral density, right? And this can make, um, obviously this can have loads of issues, right? Because of that, you get shorter, um, you can't reach stuff, um, but then also becomes a lot more difficult to breathe. So if you think, you know, your spine right now is elongated, right? So that you can, you take in a lot more oxygen. Once that becomes crushed, you get this hunched over position, it becomes way more difficult to breathe. Um, as you get older, if you have osteoporosis as well, it becomes higher risk to bone fractures, especially when you're falling, so higher risk to getting injured as well. Um, so then it comes down to, you know, what kind of symptoms, what kind of impact does menopause have? So how do you know that you might be perimenopausal or not? Um, it comes down to a lot of these symptoms that you see here. So um, potentially, you know, you have a shortened cycle. So if you notice before, maybe it was like 30 days uh, and now, it's more like maybe every 26 days, maybe every 28 days. You know, this is a sure sign. Typically, you know, periods uh, also actually get heavier as well. Mood is another one. So one moment you potentially become very, very happy. And then, and then another moment, you know, you're crying for no particular reason. A little bit like my newborn daughter, but <laughs> I don't think she has moved. Uh, hot flushes as well is also a, a very troublesome thing. You know, um, so at, they typically come at the most uh, you know, awkward times as well. But it's kind of where you just feel very, very hot. And this in turn can disturb your sleep and why you might find it more difficult to sleep. Because in order to sleep, you need to be in a you know cooler uh, body temperature. Your heart rate needs to drop. And if you're getting hot flushes, you know, this can be very disturbing for your sleep. Right? Um, you also can potentially get, you know, a bit struggle to recover a little bit more, you know, from training or uh, physical activity due to that lack of anabolic hormone that we mentioned in the previous slide, um, which means that potentially you can get more joint aches and also fatigue. Uh, some people may even get like digestive issues. So often you can feel a little bit more bloated or just something's not quite right with your normal levels of digestion, right? So it can be, you know, there's a whole variety uh, and wide range of different symptoms. Um, but again, it also comes down to how some people handle it and what they make of it as well and what individuals can also cope with. So some women are like, you know, I feel absolutely fine. And then when you actually speak to them, they're like, oh, except from, you know, I have flooding periods, you know, I'm not able to sleep very well. You know, I get hot flushes. And my husband says that I'm super, super moody all the time. Uh, but aside from that, I'm fine. Uh, so you've got some people like that where, you know, they have the whole host of all the symptoms, but they just deal with it very well. Um, and they don't feel like it influences their uh, uh, their life too much, right? But it is occurring and they, they do occur so sometimes it comes down to also you know how you manage it um you know the individual uh behaviors around uh, so what does this also mean for us in terms of exercise i say us very likely like i have menopause but i don't <laughs> and i wouldn't have to potentially be able to get it either so when i say us or we i say that very lightly um so what does this mean for exercise so because of the decline in hormones what you'll find is you're going to find you know all of these issues that you can see here right which makes it much harder to exercise so you feel that your body is changing it's getting older you feel way less motivated to exercise um because when you exercise it's then big, you know, really hard it's going to be tiring like more tiring than you, what you normally kind of feel it you feel more self-conscious because of that um actually come to think of it a lot of these symptoms uh, are very similar to some of my male clients I mean, uh, but you know all of this sounds very sad and very negative up until this point right but it doesn't mean that you definitely will gain weight. It doesn't mean that you definitely will gain fat. And doesn't it mean that you definitely will decline in health? You know, it comes down to what we ultimately do about it. You know, there are many factors that also play a role in this. So typically, um, this is uh, happening to women at a time in their life where, you know, maybe you've got children and maybe they're leaving home. They're going to university around this time, right? And you're just like, you know, things have changed. And then you're potentially feeling, you're feeling a little bit different. You know, your hormones have changed. So it becomes a very challenging environment in general, you know, outside of all the things that's happening as well, right? And all of these concerns, all of these feelings leave you a little bit more susceptible to things like crash dieting. Uh, trying to lose more body fat so it's really important that when you are doing the diet you, you aren't just looking at it in terms of i'm trying to lose body fat right because my body is changing but you're looking at it more from a global point of view so this isn't just about losing weight in however or whatever way possible 
it's about dropping body with fat through correct measures, right? Through eating more of a balanced diet, through selecting the right food choices, through increasing your daily activity. You know, if every day, you know, you are using more of your calories on things like sweet treats, you know, and crisps and junk type foods, then this is only going to heighten all of the previous things that we mentioned, right? Uh, so what can we do about it? You know, you can have a very balanced and good diet. So when I say good diet, it's about not avoiding anything. Um, it's about, you know, making sure that you've got all the fundamentals right, right? The food groups, you know, protein, carbohydrates, a little bit of fat, you know, fruits, vegetables, and of course, you know, uh, minerals, vitamins, antioxidants, all of those kind of things, right? Uh, so this is nothing like new and radical that I'm suggesting. Um, it's just a case of just going back to these fundamentals and remembering and reminding yourself, you know, um, that, you know, it isn't anything fancy. Um, it's just all of these fundamental processes, right? And the protein is always, you know, it remains very important. Um, but particularly now, because you've got this decline in those anabolic hormones. So you want to try to remove that um, or reduce the likelihood that you're going to lose muscle mass. Um, Again, you don't want to restrict carbohydrate. You know, if you do what a large degree of the fitness injury tell you where you like cut out carbohydrates, those kind of things, right? It's only going to increase your the amount of cortisol, the amount of stress that's going to be caused on your body, right? And what that cortisol does, it favors um, a fat dip as well. And, you know, when I say carbohydrates, I'm not talking about massive, enormous plates of carbs. You know, oh, him said that um, because of menopause, now I have to eat tons of carbs. That is not what I'm saying, but you definitely need to include carbohydrates in your diet and not follow any crazy things to say, you know, carbohydrates are evil and all those kind of things, right? You know, you can also supplement with vitamin D. You know, a lot of us also live in the UK. And even if you walk around butt naked in the winter, you're still not going to get enough vitamin D in the UK, right? So it's really, really um, important to supplement it because you're not going to get enough of vitamin D from food, not going to get enough from the sun. Um, so you're going to be relieved to hear that walking around naked uh, is not my recommendation uh, for increasing vitamin D level. So something around, you know, taking a tablet every day, which is like, you know, 1,000, maybe 4,000 IU daily is very, very good. Vitamin D, you know, why you want to take it is it's good for bone health, it's good for calcium uptake, it's good for immunity, it's good for recovery, all those things that uh, you're potentially going to be struggling with uh, during menopause, perimenopause. Um, so what are the practical terms, right, that we can use? So eating patterns are, you know, what does this look like in terms of a practical way? So this means this gives us an opportunity to revise and update and refresh what it is that we're doing with the nutrition. Um, and really, it's all down to consistency of what we're eating. You know, that one plate rule that we teach you, you know, the food swap principles, how does that plate ultimately look like? What does it look like to put food on that plate? right? You've got maybe a potentially a quarter of plate is, is protein, you know, uh, or a third of the plate is protein, or a quarter of the plate uh, is carbohydrate, or a third of that plate is carbohydrate, and the rest are vegetables, right? Practicing also mindful eating. So, you know, we tend to watch TV, you know, it's easy to eat uh, and watch TV. It's like, you know, when you go to cinema, I'm guilty of it too. Before you watch the films even started, you know, I've already eaten, you know, the whole popcorn bag, right? But it's going back to the basics of enjoying the company and who you're with and and the food in itself. So concentrating and focusing on what you're actually doing, what you're actually eating, rather than that feeling of thinking something, or uh, thinking about something else, right, when you're actually eating. So it's a bit like, you know, when you try to read a book, and you're thinking about something completely different, and then you're rereading the same page like 60 times, um, and you still don't have a clue what's going on, right? So mindless eating is very similar to that. Uh, and then actually, you know, protein is also very helpful in this in this stage as well in terms of like a fullness standpoint uh, and of course you know reducing um a sarcopenia which is you know what i want to now talk to you in detail about uh, so sarcopenia um it might be a word that you may have come across already uh, you may not have but it means a loss in muscle mass a loss in mass and also you know function so when you get older it becomes much, much harder to do the things that you used to do, right? Um, due to, you know, the lack of muscle uh, or the reduction in muscle. Because of this, you know, uh, it because you lose muscle, it becomes harder to do. But it's this vicious cycle where you feel like, you know, I don't really want to exercise because when I exercise, it doesn't feel great. You know, I feel tired, you know, more tired than what I used to do. Right? So then you end up not exercising. But then because you don't exercise, you end up losing muscle. And then because you lost muscle, you know, all those symptoms that you're feeling before, you feel it even more. So then that makes you not want to exercise even more. And then because of that, you lose even more muscle. So it's like this vicious cycle constantly, right? So the strength training, the resistance training, going to the gym, this is going to be a really, really important factor here. And combining that with, you know, a decent protein intake. Um, so a decent amount would probably be somewhere around a gram per pound, um, maybe even slightly less, which means having some 
like around 20 to 40 grams of protein per meal, right? That's what it will look like. So that's around about a quarter or a third of that meal uh, or a third of that plate, you could say, being protein. So let's say in the food swaps, one of those food swaps is going to be roughly around that amount, right? And ideally what you want to do is spread it out evenly throughout the day. So rather than having you know just one meal a day and eating all of it in that one meal, spreading it evenly. So maybe you're having three meals and a snack. Um, for the smaller females, maybe it's only just three meals. Something like that. So then you can digest it a little bit better rather than trying to cram it all in at the end of the day. Um, another thing that you can also do in terms of nutrition is maybe having and saving something like a Greek yogurt um, that, you know, we typically have in the snack stop, uh, in the food swap. Having that in the evening is also a very good way because, um, you know, uh, Greek yogurt is casein based, which means that it's a slower digesting protein. So it's great for when you go to sleep um, overnight. It can slowly secrete um, out of your, which brings us on to sleep um, at night. About So your hormones work during sleep, right? So when you're well rested and you make better decisions around food, your hunger hormones will work properly, right? because you're well rested so if there is a misalignment with this this can cause us to want to overeat and not stick to the diet right and also an interesting study showing that uh, good sleep is health bone health and also muscle health so practicalities of what i would advise well probably going to be the good old sleep hygiene which i'm sure a lot of you are aware of already um you know which is not just about having clean sheets and going to sleep with clean sheets right it's about you know maybe um setting a sleep and a wait time you know which is very consistent making sure that you have a good wind down routine so that you're relaxed before you go to sleep you know, not sleeping near electronics actually relaxing before bed you know rather than maybe watching you know crazy scary film um, a warm shower pre-bed, you know, um, to help the muscles relax a little bit more, to help your body temperature. Not having caffeine after 12 or 1 p.m., you know, because caffeine has a little bit of half-life. Uh, having a very dark or cool room so then your heart rate can really go down and um, you can really relax so you can go to sleep. So all of these are very, very good sleep practices and they can really help. Um, and of course, exercise as well. So exercise you know, women who exercise regularly, they're going to be better at managing their body temperature. So their body is going to be way more used to, you know, getting hot, cooling down, those kind of things, right? And the body is just better at controlling your core body temperature from exercise, which is extremely beneficial if you're getting like hot flushes from menopause, right? People who exercise, they tend to be just way better at managing um, these hot flushes, which are really, really important, right? Um, so exercise is also great for your bone health as well. Um, and the the strength benefits from resistance training, uh, which is why, you know, it's not just about going to the gym. It's not just about looking buff and getting bigger muscle, but it's about future proofing yourself to live longer. You know, we we're talking about sarcopenia. We we're talking about osteoporosis, all those things when you get older. You know, that is what you're doing when you're training is you're preventing coming on quicker uh, and to withstand old age, you know, to remain taller for longer so that your your spine doesn't get crushed from, you know, um, the bone mineral density dropping because, you know, it's going to happen far more and far more quicker for, for women than it is for men. So it's really, really important that women are, are training um, and going to the gym and, and lifting, not just because of, um, you know, looking better, but in terms of mention. um and then when you're in the gym having longer warm-ups because you know your muscles aren't as strong or as pliable as they probably used to be you know before maybe you can just get into the gym and just lift but then now it's like okay i need to spend some time on warm-up it's a little bit more tedious but you know it's going to be way more beneficial in the long run you know less likelihood of injured right and then because when you do get injured it's going to take you a lot longer to recover so that's something that you want to you want to get in there when you're in training and you want to focus on the quality over the quantity as well so i say this to you know the guys as well because everybody wants to progress so they try to train more you know, i go to the gym more but often by training too much you know not having rest days and those kind of things that can really hinder your performance and the quality so training somewhere between three to four times a week it's going to be very um, good enough and making sure that they're separate they're not like all bunched up in one shot that can really help uh so in terms of hrt so hrt is hormone replacement therapy right so the main clinical reason for suggesting and prescribing hrt is the increase in terms of the quality of it. if you're someone who is really really struggling um when you've hit menopause you know you can't get enough sleep you're really finding it difficult to you know do your job and whatever that job is whether that's you know, telling your mom and family stuff whatever it is you're just really not enjoying life um then that is where hr tends to really help you out right um hrt can also reduce breast cancer as well um after menopause because of its ability to maintain muscle 
and also your well-being. Um, but of course, before you even go into the HRT route, I would personally make changes. Um, all the things that we mentioned before on the training, on the nutrition, on the sleep, all the lifestyle things first. And then if you still feel that way, you still feel, okay, this is rough, then HRT can be a very, very viable option. Um, and I do have quite a few, or my, some of my older clients, quite a few that they are uh, taking HRT and um, they, I do notice, you know, a very different uh, demeanor from those. They, they're they generally more uplifted um, and they seem like they, they just feel a little bit. I think it, it's not like an injection or anything. Um, usually it's done through I think some sort of pack, um, if I believe in it, and it gets secreted into your body through there. I'm not 100% sure on how it works, uh, but it's, uh, it's very interesting nonetheless. Um, and then to summarize, um, you know, you're looking at nutrition so these are the things that we can ultimately control right nutrition you know getting lo lots of variety of food uh different greens having consistent regular eating patterns you know making sure you're controlling those portion size you're developing some really slow eating and very mindful eating uh, so you're not doing anything between eating um so potentially supplementing with vitamin d that's going to be really beneficial sleep as well because sleep is going to be really impacted making sure you have very very good sleep hygiene um exercise as well you know um it doesn't you know any exercise is going to be better than nothing for you um, it's going to really help you to regulate your um body temperature really keep uh strength training again it doesn't have to be lifting weight um but you know training in the gym can be really really beneficial um as well so hopefully you now sort of understand you know what's happening with the hormones and uh, during menopause that's really the biggest changes there is in your body is what's happening internally in terms of your hormones and why they have this impact on your well-being and your um and as you get a little bit older and why i guess your lifestyle is always the first always the first thing and the first go-to you know and nutrition is also a very very big part of this as well right making sure that you're hitting your protein intake to reduce those uh, negative effect muscle etc um hrt like i just mentioned on the last slide it can absolutely be helpful but ultimately you know i think the key thing to take away from this is that you need to have a personalized approach when it comes to uh, cause management right um you know everything is going to work slightly different for each female each woman everybody has a different kind of story when it comes to them and the the feelings and the symptoms that you get not everybody is going to have all the symptoms that i mentioned um and then some people might have all of them and but not feel like i've mentioned it and it feels so negative and it's like horrible but some people might not feel it in that way right so everybody is slightly different so how we approach it again is going to be very different but these are all the considerations and all the reasons why you, you may potentially be feeling um, um but realistically ultimately there isn't necessarily too much difference from what i would give somebody a male even who isn't on menopause right who doesn't have menopause who we're still looking at the things like you know lifestyle choices nutrition all the things that we focus on you know training you should still continue to be focus on except you're going to see a much bigger impact if don't do those um and as always you know support help always going to get in part uh, you always have quite uh so hopefully that helped uh slightly longer lecture um of myself but yeah there is a lot of uh, things going on when it comes so hopefully that helps don't know if anybody's watching this at right live at the moment but if you're watching the replay if you have any questions feel free to drop a message into the comment box and i will do my best uh, but aside from that hope you guys uh, enjoyed it thank you all for watching and you all in the next piece